What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's Off World Off Topic. I'm Mark Fox Powell, and that's Sam Paler. And Off World Off Topic is Off World Empire's weekly show. It is indeed. So this week we are going to be talking about take a bit of a left turn from the last few weeks. Yep. Veer off. Yeah. Talk into about unknown some, regions. Yeah. Into the future again. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Of well, course. Sort of, sort of course. Of. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's the future. It's sort of happening now. It's beginning happening now. Happen. Um, yeah. Promises for the future. Mm. Talking about technology, specifically fusion technology yeah. and fusion power, and what that might mean for for civilization in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially something that's not as far away when i started reading about this as i thought it might be yeah yeah um, but anyway 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 we'll before get we get that. into that before we get into that uh since we last discussed it spacex have landed i think we've discussed it since they've la- landed two barges yeah they have actually um landed two barges landed, landed two, two barges. rockets on barges. barges you know what i mean yeah landed a barge so yeah that's right since we last t- spoke about spacex there have been two barge landings yeah they're just doing it they're just smashing it now yeah every attempt for the last the last three attempts consecutively have all been successful so it's almost like yeah that's it now they've got it down they're just blazing it now yeah I mean it, obviously it, we can't get our hopes up too much but it does seem to be one of those things that once they've got once they've got all the kinks kind of worked out with the problems yeah, the and main, they just yeah. that's it they can just do it now yeah so there'll be unexpected failures but now it's kind of yeah it's like exactly. settling into a kind of rhythm of doing it because yeah. i mean these ones have been right on the edge of the performance sort of window as yeah. well the last two yeah yeah they have so they they do the the last two were both really high velocity high altitude mm. um missions gto yeah. missions so the first stage is going a lot faster and a lot a lot higher than the the low earth orbit ones yes um which means that basically means that it they can't I think they have to conserve the fuel for the actual landing so they can't do what the boost back burn no they end up landing that's why they land on the barges yeah and the boost back burn um, well they do a boost back burn even for the uh, the low earth orbit barge landings they did the, oh, yeah. basically the boost back burn is just to cancel the, the like lateral velocity yeah just slow it down a bit yeah um, whereas these ones they don't do that so it comes in really really hot hot yeah yeah and if you see that that video that they released from this last one the Tycom yeah. 8 launch that video taken on the first stage. Yeah, it's an incredible. As it video. kind of flips round. Yeah. And you see the curvature of the you earth. You see the gas thrusters going. Yeah, cold gas thrusters firing, and then it starts to re enter the atmosphere, and it, you know, the camera starts vibrating, and you see fire on the grid fins. You know, yeah, you all proper... the way up to the grid fins, yeah, yeah. on yeah, one yeah. side. Yeah. So, so, yeah, a lot of speed and heat being transferred back up, yeah. up the side of the rocket. Yeah. That was yeah, really cool, that video. That's amazing. If you haven't seen it, go go look on the SpaceX YouTube yeah, definitely. channel because uh, it's well worth watching. Yeah, I mean, it's one, it is, it's one of the coolest videos I've seen in a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a fucking rocket, like land, landing on a bar, move, going from essentially from space yes. through, through the lower atmosphere and landing on a barge and you just get to watch the whole thing. Yeah, it's sped up, but... It is better. I wonder if they'll put a... A full, a full, a full one, yeah. The thing is, I think, that, I think part of it might have been cut... If you actually watch it, it's, it's very quick to go from high altitude to the barge. So I reckon that there's a bit where they've just like chopped out some footage. And Why just do you reckon they've chopped that out? I don't know. I could be wrong. Should we do it in Nutters of the Week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fake. The whole um, thing. Maybe it's to do with some fancy thing that they don't want to share with other... Co- they, they, they don't patent things, do they, SpaceX? They don't patent things in the sense that they're co- they do they don't do that because their competitors are, are like national governments. They don't think it's. I'm pretty sure they don't patent things on in the sense that it, they just put essentially if they do patents, they're putting that information out and then yeah. someone like the Russian government will just pick it up and be like, oh, we'll just do this, and then SpaceX will try and sue them and they'll just go no, and that's it. Touch <laughs> it. You can't really sue governments yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So they're just keeping it quiet. So that that maybe there's some. Uh, you know, fancy little thing that helps them land some innovation that they don't want to reveal. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really it's possible. I I have no idea. I mean, like, it could be wrong. It could not be cut at all. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, well, it could just be that the the camera just got covered in crap for a while. Um, yeah, and didn't I mean, clear until it was lower. So yeah, there's, sort of, just... exactly. There's bits when it comes through the atmosphere where there's loads of condensation, like precipitation on yeah. the on the camera lens. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's just that. Maybe it's just been blocked off for another reason. But anyway, so the last. The last one before this one, Elon said on Twitter that it took max damage, which I think means basically that this is <laughs> maximum this is, damage. Yeah, had one health left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the um, the maximum amount of damage they would expect from a landed booster. Okay, from from the previous one. 
so I, I would assume that this one's kind of similar um just because it's a similar like velocities and all that yeah um but that's that's sorry that's just the maximum they would expect yes not the maximum it could take although that what the maximum they could take i mean what does that mean well the, but the maximum the they could they would expect makes sense yeah so i guess from looking at from doing tests and fires you know firing these stages on the ground which yeah. they will do they'll work out you know exactly what maximum damage really means and how much sure. refurbishment that i'll need and stuff to reuse oh right yeah i see what you mean yeah yeah that would be interesting to see how much they have to do on those those uh, ones that have come in faster yeah and that's if this latest one makes it back to port because as we're filming this it still hasn't as far as i know yeah i don't there hasn't been any word of it being damaged overnight though or falling over or no. anything like that no we haven't heard anything more they may by the time this goes out i mean that they may have but but it, it crushed some kind of crumple zone in the legs when it landed mm. that was there obviously for safety reasons yeah. just to just absorb energy yeah um which means that it was a bit wobbly but, yeah yeah, they, they were worried it wasn't going to survive the night, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, I hope it doesn't tip over. Because, but no. it would be kind of cool to see another explosion video. <laughs> yeah, but they might not be filmed. Well, I guess, th would they be continually filming Yeah, probably it? not, actually. They no. might not. I don't know. I'm not, not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, they'll be reusing these potentially then. Yeah. Later on in the year. Yeah. We keep our eyes out for that. Yeah, first reused flight is going to be a big, big deal. Mm. So that's going to be cool. And one of the SpaceX um, delivery cargo things has gone well as well the big low thing finally inflated oh yeah it turned yeah. a bit of a problem inflating i'm not entirely sure what happened it got chode no. before it got long yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the technical description <laughs> yeah it sort of ballooned out sideways and they yeah. couldn't get it to extend for some reason um anyway but it seems to have worked now on the second attempt yeah so watching the tell you watching that live stream of them inflating that I watched it for about five minutes. It was the, one of the most boring things I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it was because the NASA they stri live streamed it, and yeah. the guy just like periodically lets in for a second. They're like uh, about a second of air. It just lets in this air. They you know coming in at a certain pressure, and they're watching all these pressure like safety curves and things and monitoring it. And it's just like imagine it's just like inflating a balloon over like six hours. Yeah, just going. You'd be like, even if you were the astronaut, you'd be like, fuck this, come on. <laughs> Just smash the button. Open the hatch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> balloon. But yeah, so now there's a big balloon attached to the space station. There is. Which is quite cool. A big old balloon. I don't know if they're really going to go into it. I think they're just going to leave it there and, and leave it I think they are going to go ages. into it, aren't they? They're going to they're well, put some monitoring stuff in it. And... But yes, but they might think, well, I think they might be going into it sort of suited up as if... Is that right? Not treating it as a Initially. part of the habitat. Um, and just kind of monitoring it and seeing what happens. They are definitely going to be monitoring it for a long period of time to check it's the pressure doesn't change. Yeah. Check the air quality and stuff. But I yeah. think I do think they are going to be they are going to be going into it properly. Just 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 you know as, it, as if it's any other part of the space station. Yeah, without an, an That's cool. EVA suit. Because the hope is obviously that you have whole stations built of this stuff. Yeah. So. It's stronger. The, the material is stronger for impacts and stuff. And we talked about this in another video. Yeah. For impacts than uh, the you know the rest of the space station it might even be the safest part of the space station but obviously you've got to test it out first because it's untried tech yeah well it's not untried i mean they've flown missions with it big low house yeah sure um but it's never been attached to the iss before yeah. so you've got to be careful about how you know there might be some unknown yeah engineering thing they need to work out yeah. who knows uh, yeah i mean you have to be that's the thing you have to yeah. be super yeah that's why the stream was boring yeah because they have to be so incredibly careful yeah you just imagine, ah, oh, a depressurization just, space yeah. station would be just catastrophic. Oh, everyone just dies. Yeah, everyone would just die immediately. <laughs> did, you see, did you see that picture that Tim Peake sent back of a crack in the space station? Yeah, window? that's terrifying. Yeah, you imagine being on there and just there's a like this crack in one of the windows. If that goes, that's it. You're dead. Do they have any kind of a chance at all? I don't think so. You'd pass out too quickly. But it's not gonna, it, the space station won't decompress instantly. It will take a few it'll, it'll, seconds. Yeah, but I don't know if it will sort of catastrophically. Yeah, so you just get to, sucked. So, well, if there there would be air going out, yeah. whether it would be a small amount or whether it was suddenly because there's air going out, it would like blast the window out or yeah. something. I, I really don't know. Yeah. So say the whole. I mean, you, the, you have not got long. Say the windows. So the hole's big enough to just take a person through. Oh yeah, that's they're they're f yeah. yeah they're screwed. Yeah, Surely they're bad. screwed. It would take a while to decompress, but it would not. It would be extremely rapid, wouldn't it? You'd like have a, to like a rapid decompression in a plane. Yeah, that's yeah, that, yeah. You're right. That kills everybody instantly, pretty much. Or it knocks them out normally. Yeah. I mean, if if an explosive goes off in a plane, say, yeah, and blows a hole in it, and then the whole thing will just decompress, and then 
yeah that's not good that's not you good you pass news. out first you probably pa- I imagine in space you pass out before anything else yeah, kills you yeah just before, from the, the pressure drop yeah I guess your only chance is if you happen to be in the Sawyers for some reason like packing it or something yeah, and, and you, you just hit, quickly cho- well, close the door would you reckon you'd be able to close it the air's being dragged out of it could you shut the the hatch down it might be too much airflow movement sketchy yeah, I mean, real sketchy. Yeah, I mean, this That's is just the, the dangers da- you accept by being on the space station. This is a tangent, isn't it? But yeah. the, the the ISS feels so cushy normally. I don't. I mean that in the sense that, like, I know it's sort of like camping in space. But in comparison to the Apollo missions and all or this Mir. kind of stuff, or Mir, yeah. Jesus, um, there's something slightly cushy about being yeah. on a space station. Yeah, it's space. It was quite. It's relatively spacious and and yeah. feels a bit more high tech and a bit more kind of. And I don't know. Just people have been going there for years, and you know, it's just sort of a yeah, just a habitat in space that you kind of go to. And, yeah. and the dangerous bit, you always maybe you know, I suppose it is the dangerous bit, just traveling there and back. And once you're there, it's kind of like maybe not so bad. Yeah. But you just think, just just the, that glass, something smashes yeah. from things, and there's a lot of debris orbiting around the Earth, lots of crap. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not. It's amazing that it's not it far away from more being often, really. de- from death, huh? It's amazing that it doesn't happen more often. Sort of micrometeorite impacts and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess that maybe it's just. I mean, space even even at low Earth orbit is a lot of room for stuff. It's built to withstand certain amount. Obviously, of, yeah. as we saw, some level of um, impacts, but yeah, just crazy, just crazy, crazy to watch. Yeah. So that's why I guess the Bigelow thing would help with that as well because it's it's tougher. Yeah. I wonder how much of the time you spend up there worried about this kind of stuff probably not at all I would imagine you just forget, try and forget about yeah, it you just forget about it although when you Tim have moments did... where you're kind of in, at night maybe on your own trying to go to sleep and you just suddenly start thinking about the reality of what's going on it's like mm, this is a bit yeah, you're just a bit a, sketchy you're just asleep if, if, if that happens in your sleep again yeah. you're screwed yeah but like the film Gravity the very beginning of that yeah and it all goes to shit yeah <laughs> Yeah. very much yeah. yeah it would be like well it wouldn't be that dramatic well no obviously a depressurization of the space station do you think you, yeah do you think if you were near the um the astro the eva suits you could sort of get a helmet on in time or something get something on i mean i don't know another problem is that before they go out on eva astronauts it's been hours pure hours. o2 yeah for like 20 minutes to stop themselves getting the bends yeah um so that's also an issue <laughs> Yeah, they're probably just done for, really, aren't they? Yeah. Unless they can get into the the bends probably comes around not instantly. Though, no, does it? I suppose so not. you're going to end up if you can get yourself into the Sawyers. Yeah, that's that's whatever, your only chance. Whatever boat rescue boat yeah. is available at the time. That's your only chance is to get is to is to get into that. But say say you just manage to get into that without your gear, you're just in there with a hatch shut in just like your normal clothes and you're just a bit like okay now we have to just abort and you, and you have to bail on everyone else in the space yeah, station you yeah, can't yeah, open yeah. the hatch properly no. you can just look out and watch everyone floating around unconscious yeah yeah you just have to bail just kind of strap <laughs> yourself in best you can with what you've got <laughs> here we go and get your uh, you know your, your your tick sheet out whatever they have the checklist <laughs> yeah. the giant wads of paper that they use to go through all the stuff yeah. man that must be that yeah must be anyway, anyway 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 <laughs> <Moving on. laughs> um, right yeah before we start the main topic yeah um I think it's worth discussing a comment we've had, mm-hmm. as ever. So a comment from uh, Rich Hart, who has written on a few videos. So thank you for your continued comments. Um, so he was talking about, we were talking about Europa. Yes. We were talking about sterilising. Spacecraft. Spacecraft. Slash mm. hydro mole probe and, things. Yes. And we mentioned that you might be able to use the radiation around Europa to help sterilise yes. the spacecraft. Yes. He said... Would the radiation on Europa's surface be enough to sterilise the spacecraft? Um, I thought some bacteria are pretty much immortal, even when bom- bombarded with space radiation. Which is true, kind of true. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's right. Um, so, I guess, uh, well, I mean, we've known about, I work with and have worked with a few of well, things like Deinococcus radiodurans, which is a highly radiation resistant bacterium. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there are there are organisms even more radiation resistance than Deinococcus. Yeah. And they definitely can withstand the bombardment of Europa's radiation for a long, long time. Periods of time, yeah. So the radiation on Europa would kill a human in about a day or, or two. Yeah. The, the dose you'd get. But after thousands of days exposed yeah. to that kind of level of radiation, you still have almost complete retained viability in some in of di- these. With Deinococcus, yeah. yeah. Um, 
So, although you, having said that, I mean, you, the, the, the radiation and the, the cold and everything, you would still probably, it would still contribute to helping to yeah, knock off yeah. a few vulnerable things that had survived at that point. It's all about getting your, you know, get, lowering the risks as much as possible. Mm. And it's only going to help um, in sterilizing. sterilizing. Yeah. It's only going to make it more tricky for something to survive. Yeah. But there are plenty of things on Earth that we know are capable of surviving that level of radiation. Um, yeah. Especially, and, that, and that's if they're just sat there on the surface of, of a component. Yeah. But if they're somehow tucked underneath in a crack or underneath exactly. something, then I mean, you know, then they're probably shielded from a considerable amount of it. And then. I mean, even non radiation resistant microbes like E. coli, mm. they, 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 it's just like we were doing, we we're looking at some of the doses and, and calculating the, some of the differences. And it, yeah. it looks like something even like E. coli can survive, I don't know. 100 times more radiation roughly ish yeah very roughly about than, 100 times more than uh humans and so a human dies in a day it's going to take like 100 days to kill just e coli which is like the most bog standard yeah yeah non not really you know radiation resistant microbes so and that's the kind of thing that's not the kind of thing you would expect anyway because the the clean room you know the, the, the spacecraft sterilization procedures before it launches will probably get rid of stuff like e coli yes so and that's your baseline is mm. is you know 100 days or so exposure to the to the radiation rope surface to kill something like that but the things that are going to be left on the spacecraft are going to be even more going to be t- pretty way hard. more radiation tolerant yeah pretty hardy um so even leaving it out on the surface for thousands of days mm. isn't going to kill these things no and by that time your instruments would have been killed by the radiation anyway yeah so the radiation and surface environment don't look like good ways really to do much sterilization no really it's not a vi- you've got to you know that's not you can't really rely on that in any way shape or form yeah but you can kill humans with it so that might that, be useful. that might be useful yeah <laughs> you don't want to contaminate you over with humans <laughs> you've got a human <laughs> trapped in a cargo hold <laughs> and expose it to the surface oh god yeah <laughs> some sort of illegal immigrant <laughs> trying to sneak his way to Europa <laughs> I think you'll regret that pretty quickly on, on getting uh, yeah. there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> to get nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, so that, that's probably, as you said, it's a way of, of reducing the risk, but. Yeah, you might cut well, it down a bit. Yeah, you might cut it down a bit, yeah. but it's not, it's not going to be something that's engineered into the mission profile, probably. Oh, let's wait on the surface for a while to let everything die. Probably not. Because no. it's not going to be successful. No, it seems like the instrumentation is going to be more sensitive to the radiation than the microbes you're trying to kill. Yeah. So, not good. Not good. <laughs> Time for the main topic. So this week we're talking about fusion. Nuclear fusion. 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 And fusion, fusion power. And fusion technology. Fusion. Yeah. Exa- exactly. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good word to say. It is a good word. It's a very good word. <laughs> I like it a lot. Yeah, so this sort of stuff crops up in a lot of sci-fi, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of uh, everyone's got fusion drives in the in the sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fusion drives take you anywhere. Yeah, fusion. it's a word that gets bandied around a lot. Mm. Isn't isn't Iron Man's like thing a fusion reactor? I think it is. I think he just knocked it up in a cave. Yeah, as you do. Yeah, well, Tony standard. Tony Stark. Yeah, it's legit. You can do that. Yeah. So anyway, he's so like f- so he, fusion. The fictional Elon. <laughs> Well, he, I mean, literally, he kind of is, right? I don't know. I don't know how exactly that relationship works, as in whether they... Well, obviously, the character of Tony Stark existed before yeah. Elon was Elon. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because <laughs> he's from a comic. Yes. But um, I don't think... The rumour asked... goes, the story goes that Robert Downey Jr. based him in some way on Elon. Although, obviously, if you actually look at Elon and, the, you know, Elon talking and doing, doing speeches and then Tony Stark, there's a bit of a difference. Yeah. But, yeah, anyway there's something going on there anyway yes anyway. Iron Man has fusion power and that's the end of the topic <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so fusion is the sort of stuff you get in the sun the sun's a, a big yes. old fusion reactor in it yes it is <laughs> let's explain what fusion is no <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've got it then yeah okay what's fusion so fusion is the process that yeah as you said hap- that happens in stars <laughs> yeah. as you kind of said um, basically okay. elements fusing together yeah. Um, to make heavier elements. I mean, that's a sort of how all of the elements in the universe yeah. uh, were formed after, you know, hydrogen and helium. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which which sort of, the fact that that releases a lot of energy is not it's very... It's kind of, yeah, it's counterintuitive. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. Because 
surely you, you, how does shoving things together make energy come out <laughs> yeah yeah in a, in a kind of it normally when you think of you know atoms and, and nuclear energy breaking them apart and like release as, as if it's like an egg yeah. and inside is delicious energy yeah when you release it out that makes much more sense but it doesn't that's not actually what happens well it is i mean with fission you get a lot of energy coming out yeah oh yeah sure but sure. for some reason well not for some reason but with fusion mm. um the, the, what's going on in the sun mm. you have you know four or five times the amount of energy released from from fusing nuclei from then from fish fishing them <laughs> Pre- yes. uh, performing fission on them yes sure yeah sure. yeah so so anyway so you lose a load of mass don't you the, the two the two it. things that go in the product that comes out has a quite a lot less mass than the than the, the two, th- things two things that came in that and that mass in. is converted to energy basically exactly if we convert energy with e equals mc squared so yeah. you get a lot of energy out of a little amount of mass yeah um, and that's basically that's the concept behind it yeah. and we obviously know that it's sound it's not it's, you know it's not just a someone's theory it's, it's happening in the sun yes yeah it's happening all over the universe mm-hmm. so it's just a case of trying to Bottle put that in sun. a box yeah. so that we can use some of it yeah. some of that delicious fusion <laughs> yeah and in a way I mean it is kind of the ultimate energy source yes for, for well I mean maybe I don't know if there's any I think it's like antimatter produce more energy, and they react that the the uh, energy produced from an antimatter annihilation is the the mass that's converted to energy is much higher than in a fusion reaction. But it's potentially more dangerous. It's potentially more dangerous and m- much harder to produce, etc., etc. Fusion seems like it could be a really legitimate way to power and a very sustainable way to power the future, or pretty much indefinitely. Yeah, with with very little sort of environmental cost or safety mm. concern or or just cost generally yeah you know once you get these things running they're self-sustaining over long periods of time with very little fuel um to produce a lot of energy yeah so and we'll talk about the different designs for some of them yeah because the cost thing is um something that's that's, that's worth discussing further sure because some designs are mad 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 expensive um, yeah, especially in the moment, and it's go- and it's going to be a, a huge effort, potentially a huge effort. I mean, again, we'll talk about this more uh, for humanity to get one of these things, to get a, a concept working that we can use everywhere. Yeah. And people are pouring billions into these things. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the basic concept then is to ba- have a have fusion reactions happening, so the melding of nuclei inside a box, as you said. Yeah. Contained generally by a magnetic field. Yeah, and then uh, use the energy that that releases essentially to, to do what we already do in power stations which is drive a turbine of some kind yeah. and produce electricity yeah which seems like a bit a bit of an old-fashioned link in the chain really when you think about it because basically what yeah. they're proposing doing is using the heat from from a fusion from fusion reactions to boil water yeah and make steam drive a turbine yeah, it's like a super like... a super advanced sun in a box yeah and then you've just got a t- boiling water like <laughs> turning an old steam turbine yeah put, put the pans of boiling water in, <laughs> you know. yeah. yeah but um there are designs that that would be able to potentially convert yes. straight from the heat straight not even from heat energy straight from uh, the movement of neutrons and things and in the inside the fusion reactor straight yeah. to electricity not actually through which is the, n- the next step in the kind of second generation of these things or, or you know generations down the line yeah. will will probably if this is a viable technology we'll probably st- look at developing that kind of thing because if you cause at the moment all of the designs which we'll talk about in a minute all yeah. use a particular um fuel which is two isotopes of hydrogen so yeah. two two different types of hydrogen that have different numbers of neutrons mm-hmm. and that's because those two things are the easiest to shove together yeah and get to start fusing yeah if you know what i mean um but the the things like helium which are slightly heavier mm. they're harder to shove together but once you get the, the fusion reactants going they chuck out protons which are electrically mm. charged and it means you can actually use that to directly induce a, ch- a charge in you know oh like yeah because your, the, your normally wires. the neutrons that are spraying out are not yeah charged. normally the neutrons spray out of the height of the hydrogen isotope yeah. fusion so deuterium you, tritium tritium and deuterium yeah. yeah so yeah you have to use you have to somehow absorb the energy of those neutrons to then generate heat whereas and then you know, boil your steam and all that crap <laughs> whereas with the helium you actually get protons coming out which means you can use the electrical current of from the protons hmm. Um, to induce an electric current, sorry, for the the charge of the protons to induce an electric current directly, yes. so you get a much higher like uh, yield from your from your fusion. Exactly. So that's the dream. That's the dream. But currently, the dream is 
hydrogen and well deuterium and tritium yes yeah and they're different you have to have different temperatures to meld together different yeah types of isotopes and different um yeah different nuclei don't you if, yes if that's the, right the fusion yeah. temperature they start they, they maximize for the two you were just talking about deuterium tritium at, at something like 8 million kelvin or 800 million 800 kelvin. million yeah. kelvin um yeah. which is so kelvin is just high. like Kel- that's so basically take off 273 and you have degrees centigrade yeah so it's mad, mad high wait no add on 273 right oh, i can't remember but it's basically when you get up yeah. to 800 million adding on or taking away 273 is basically the same number anyway yeah so well yeah 800 million degrees c Mm-hmm. basically yeah it's which is hot. <laughs> yeah and you've got to contain that in a box yeah um yeah so so mad hot but the, as as you go up to some of these heavier these different um nuclei fusions you end up having to go up to sort of you know bill- billions like you know eight billion <laughs> eight billion kelvin which is again it getting harder and harder to, con- to contain that type of energy yeah and the most difficult thing with fusion reactors is is not un- unlike f- fission reactors which are you're sort of trying to contain it stop it getting out of control mm. because it's just like trying to you know go mad and yeah. breed itself faster and faster and faster the problem with fusion reactors is actually keeping them going yeah and that's one of the reasons why they're so safe is because you don't have all the radioactive fallout for a start. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be in a fusion reactor while it's on or near it. But if, it, if, if say, uh, someone dropped a bomb on a fusion reactor, it would just turn off. Yeah. Because exactly. everything, the, the plasma, the, the fusion reactor is going on, the heat would dissipate and they'd all just grind to a halt almost immediately. Yeah. The whole thing relies on keeping all that energy contained so yeah. that the, the fusion can go on. If, if that plasma or whatever it is that's undergoing fusion gets out, it's just going dis- to the energy is going to dissipate rapidly yeah and you're just no longer going to have a fusion reaction yeah so yeah in that sense it's it's very safe there's no there's no worry about like accidentally creating a star or something <laughs> you know <laughs> um i wonder if there'll be i'm pretty sure i've seen people you know I've seen things like that written about it i was going to say i wonder if there'll be if we eventually get one of these things working if there'll be large hadron collider type uh, black hole gonna yeah. eat, eat the world type stories probably i'm i'm almost certain there will be in fact they probably already exist that'd be good yeah they're always good fun <laughs> yeah um helium is the main byproduct of the uh um the current sort of generation of, of yeah. technologies so you can just fill balloons or just <laughs> just, just, just get walk around with a voices. squeaky voice so you know it's not that much of a problem <laughs> um so yeah basically i mean to be honest it's kind of the perfect it is fuel source energy source yeah i mean there's not really much apart from the fact that it's very high tech and probably very difficult to build and possibly uh, there's some questions about how keeping them maintained this sort of stuff mm. if you can get it working and solve those engineering problems there's not really a chink in its armor no it's pretty spectacular and in terms of numbers as well it's something like one kilo of fusion fuel yeah. so in this case hydrogen isotopes of hydrogen yeah would c- would have the same energy density when it undergoes fusion as 100 million kilos of fossil fuels <laughs> so you just think about how how little fuel you need to to run one of these reactors and produce enough energy to power you know like whole cities and stuff in yeah. comparison to just the amount of stuff we have to hack out of the ground yes. to do it currently yeah which does all sorts of things that we don't want yeah so, so yeah it's 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 almost like you know someone's just made up a magic solution to the problem to our, <laughs> to our problems yeah the, the problem was sort of sitting in the sky the whole time yeah you know, just sort of going this is how you solve your energy crisis yeah um we can't find a way to do it yet though not yet but there's some things on the horizon that are looking there are potentially promising there are there are so most of the things that people that are developing this then are large governments aren't they i mean they're, they're sort of multinational yeah. efforts yeah involving you know european countries america yeah uh, often all sorts of places yeah huge huge uh, uh, um collaborations between governments between huge, yeah lots of countries yeah um so what what's the name of the big project that's doing the t- uh the, down in france the iter which is iter yeah you know, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Something about thermonuclear energy, something or other. International Which thermonuclear is? energy reactor. Ter, energy reactor. It could be something. It could. It's definitely got the word thermonuclear in there. Okay, cool. 
which is good because that's an awesome word. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that thing, I mean, that thing is is gigantic for a yeah. start. Yeah. So so that's that's funded by. It's a global. Is it a global funding body? Or yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, it's, it's the US, Russia. Everyone's got chips. France, in. loads of European countries. Yeah. I don't know if China's involved or not, but possibly. In fact, they might not be. But anyway, probably um, got their own thing. Going sure. On. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and that's that's costing like fourteen billion or something. At the or moment. more. I mean, it's already at fourteen billion. Yeah. And that's already over budget, and it's not going to be done until <laughs> twenty nineteen. And then they're going to start testing it in 2020 something. And then they're not even going to start running proper uh, plasma experiments. So the real kind of fusion stuff until the late 2020s. So by that point, who knows what the cost of it is going to have run into. Yes. Um, it's an extremely expensive. Mega project. Mega project. Yeah. Another good word. This episode's full of good words. Oh, yeah. So uh, in, uh, <laughs> how much was the Large Hadron Collider? A lot. To build? I think we looked this up, but I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Was it? So that's a, uh, obviously a similar scale project. Um, this thing down in France is a um, is absolutely massive. <laughs> yeah. By the way, <laughs> well, 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 describe what type of so so there's a, yeah reactor so this, is, it is. this is probably it's probably worthwhile talking about the different types of um, a fusion reactor. Thirteen point two five billion for the LHC. Had, yeah. Okay. So that's less. That's than the, in talking. Oh, that's the cost. Oh, that, I remember looking this up now. And that's all that's, the costs. That's the cost of, of finding the Higgs boson, yes. right? Yeah. So that, that includes the cost of building the thing and, and running yes. it up until the, that, the, the discovery yeah. was made. Yeah. Yeah, so this thing down in France is a lot, lot more expensive. It's about than a that. billion a year operating budget. Cool billion. Cool bill. Yeah. So anyway, so the, there's the, the several different types of... Um, well, that, it, there's sort of two... Fun, on a fundamental level, yeah. there's two different ways people try to do fusion. Sure. One of them is called inertial confinement mm. fusion, and the other one is magnetic confinement. Mm. I think that's what they're called. Basically, one of them is uh, literally just a fuel pellet that you fire lasers at yeah. from all directions. Yeah. Um, really, really high-powered lasers. Yeah. And you try and get the, the fuel pellet to, to collapse in on itself under extreme heat and start a fusion reaction in the center. Sort which of then implode. Goes, yeah, implodes. Starts a fusion reaction in the center, undergoes a chain reaction, and then the, the whole fuel pellet starts to undergo fusion. Yeah, that's that's what that is. Yes, and there, that's that moment of chain reaction is called ignition, and they have places like the National Ignition Facility in the US where they built tons and tons of like megawatt lasers for, yeah. for firing at these fuel pellets. Mm. Um, but I mean, they've they've done cool stuff with these things. You know, they've managed to get more energy out of these reactions than they put in. Yeah. Um, but they have not reached ignition, which is this chain reaction, which is self-sustained fusion. Yeah. Um, I think one of the main problems with it is that um, it's really hard to get symmetrical. You have to have the, the fuel pellet collapse in an exactly symmetrical way. Oh, right. Otherwise, you get you know blowout on one side or yeah. another. But you need that all the pressure going inwards to the Exerted core. Exerted exactly, exactly the same. Exactly the same, and that's one of the, one of the many hurdles to it. Yeah. That's that's the inertial confinement. Um, so that's that's uh, that's one angle. The other one, which seems to be a bit more promising, and it's what this giant place down in France is using, mm. is magnetic confinement. So that's basically you have a plasma, just like a really hot ionized form of matter. They heat that up with mi microwaves or something. Is that it? I think some of the some well the the one of the Lockheed one I think was using microwaves to start with. That, I actually don't know how they heat the plasma. How they get yeah, the plasma. plasma? They they yeah. get plasma. <laughs> just buy some plasma <laughs> in like a bottle or something yeah don't don't go down to a you know, <laughs> co-op or whatever so the <laughs> so the plasma so yeah so so magnetic confinement they you have a super hot plasma and because you know you need it at 800 million degrees or whatever yeah that you can't contain it with just with materials and the material no. can survive that so you use magnetic fields to contain the plasma so that's magnetic confinement yeah and this big old thing down in france is a form of magnetic confinement reactor called a tokamak which is a, another cool word. Yeah, it's a nice word. It's Tokamak. a Russian. It's a Russian Tokamak. acronym. Oh, it's an acronym. Yeah, token stands for Russian stuff. Yes, I imagined it wouldn't. Is it that's a Russian language acronym? Surely it's using Cyrillic. Cyr yeah, it is. If you look it up on Wikipedia, it gives you in brackets the ah. the Cyrillic, but it's pronounced the same. Cool. And it looks very similar because those letters are very similar. Yeah. Um. So that basically confines it. Yeah, with magnetic confinement, which yeah. is it's it's. 
it's different from a stellarator, right? A stellarator also uses magnetic confinement. Yeah. But a stellarator, but they they basically differ slightly in the way that they actually the the way they arrange the magnets in order to keep the plasma stable. Yeah. That's kind of the only real difference. That is, yeah. So to, so to, I think stellarators are uh, the kind of original, slightly older design. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Um, which was ba- basically the problem is once you have plasma and things are flying around with ridiculous energy yeah the problem is keeping them all together where they're close enough to, to undergo fusion because their tendency is for them to all just fly off in crazy directions sure. um so to do that they come up with various like, geometries of, of the plasma so that, they, that its tendency to fly off is then harnessed in a way that feeds it back into the middle of the reaction and stuff like yeah. that it's all a bit kind of complicated but the the tokamax <laughs> the tokamax um they they're, they're like a torus like a ring of plasma mm-hmm and a donut. that's yeah and that's generated by basically feeding like a helical magnetic field all the way around it um running at that magnetic current basically through the plasma itself um whereas the stellarators which are the other kind are just a series of like rings of magnets around the outside of the thing which yes just by applying an external magnetic field and twisting it in a certain way physically twisting the the, the actual tube of it twists yeah the magnet the, yeah. literally the, the, the geometry of the magnets is twisted round yeah, and round exactly. and round and round and kind of a- that's what creates this sort of helical um, path for all the particles that keeps them from flying off yeah um, so it's just two slightly different ways of doing it and the stellarators look insane yeah they do the, the, uh, the stellarator they've got built I will talk about the the different ones a bit more in more detail. Yeah, I think that the 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 tokamak the tokamak one is bigger, isn't it? Large, yeah, well, the larger. In- well, I mean, then they're not as a rule larger. It just happens to be that the the the, the major tokamak project at the moment is bigger than the stellarator one in Germany. Yeah, the Eiter one in France is freaking massive. Yeah, it's beast. You see, you can find like cro- like images like just renders of a cross section of it of the you know the tube that the plasma is going to be going yeah. through next to a person yeah and it's like you know it's big enough to drive a bus through it's yeah. fucking huge yeah it's a big big boy big donut of plasma <laughs> um, um but the stellarators i mean you can go you could get a guy through the you know the, the cavity yeah. in the middle yeah you could walk through the cavity in the, could you walk through the cavity but anyway it's big enough to get a person through but it's it's you know it's no it's not as large you can drive a bus through or anything no but it's still it's still a big piece of equipment it's not yeah, 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 and it looks mental. Like uh, the stellarators, because they have that weird sort of twisting, yeah, coils of magnets and stuff. Yeah, it looks like some way between a cross between like a roller coaster and <laughs> intestines. <laughs> if you had some kind of like mechanized intestine system that also was a roller coaster, that's what it looks like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's it's a really, really. I mean, it crazy kind, it kind thing. of does look like that. A stellarator. I mean. A stellarator oh man it's just full of awesome words a stellarator it's a stellar a sun radiator like this yeah. you know a star that's a it's a machine for doing the sun's business <laughs> <laughs> doing doing the stuff what an analogy <laughs> you know yeah like like you said like a radiator but it's a stellarator yeah it's a great name um yeah so those are the two those are the two big projects at the moment the yeah. two kind of mainstream yeah so the one in germany that i think did you mention the name of it the the Wendelstein. I didn't mention the name. No. Wendelstein Seven X or something like that. It, it's so that that's very much experimental. Obviously, so is the one in France. But I think the the, the Stellarator in Germany is intended uh, purely to demonstrate the possibility of using a Stellarator. Yeah. Um, for for uh, sustained reactions, rather, I think the the France one. They're not going to turn it into a power station, but no. it's it's meant to be a bit. It's meant to be a step beyond that. I think. Um, yeah basically uh, evaluating a design for an eventual power station yeah so it's only to put like five times the amount of or get out five times the amount of energy it put in right they put in for this item one yeah the item one i think they're, they're gonna moment they're, it's one of its aims is to momentarily momentarily whatever that means probably milliseconds or less yes produce 10 times the uh, amount oh, right, of energy yeah. that's gone in but then actually have a sustained reaction that's producing five times i mean that's it right that's a legitimate fusion power station basically kind of yeah i mean they're not running it in the sense that it's not supposed to be a, it's not going to be kind of getting its money back no they're not going to just plug it in to the mains <laughs> yeah they? no no it's all for, it's all still just for hardware testing it is yeah i think that they, there's there's many things that need to other things beyond just the fusion mm. reaction itself that also need to be worked out in terms of building a, a successful economic power station yes um 
so so yeah so i think that's what the iter um the goal of the iter uh reactor is mm. is to sort of evaluate all those kind of steps that you need yeah. to how you repair it all this kind of things exactly yeah oh. and, and and you know things to do with how to how to more efficiently capture the high energy neutrons and turn them into heat and all that kind of yes. stuff all yeah. these these hurdles yeah um, uh, but the the the, the one st- what's it white oh, wendelstein say, wendelstein yeah um, stellarator stellarator is is i think is just the the aim is just to run it for 30 minutes have, basically show that you can run a stellarator continually for 30 minutes um, yeah as uh, which is like, like one of the obviously one of the cornerstones of of a stellarator of a design using a stellarator so it's yeah like you say not not as ambitious or as far along in terms of development in no. the same way it's not it's not reaching for the same thing as the ITER it's not quite no but but it's operational now yeah <laughs> which is the different I mean I think well it's the, not op- well they've st- the, they, they've t- tested they've, it or something they've started in, putting in like December. yeah exactly they've started running it like you're literally running it yeah putting in um they've started they did some plasma burns to to remove any um sort of debris or, or dirt basically on the inside <laughs> of the this thing you just put like an eight eight million degree plasma through it just to give it a clean <laughs> <laughs> some engineers forgot to get out in time yeah, <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> the end of that it's been obliterated yeah. um yeah so there are other projects though of course oh, yeah of course yeah yeah yeah. it's just that that ITER one is by far the biggest yeah but there are other other tokamak style projects mm. it's like the joint european taurus and a few other projects and yeah. there's, there's lots of ignition ones uh, sorry the inertial confinement ones scattered around as well yeah I, I, am I don't I think I re- read this incorrectly but the the inertial confinement method mm. was starting to become people starting to think that maybe it's just not a good method of going about trying to start fusion reactions or trying to go about trying you know getting a fusion power station I think so I think that, that national ignition facility in the US is is kind of quite old now i think yeah and they still haven't managed to achieve um ignition um but i think i think it's just that the power you need from late if it's all the power is coming from lasers that it's a lot of power (laughs) Um, obviously you know the 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 threshold energy to get a fusion reaction started is the same regardless of whether you have plasma or or a fuel pellet or whatever but it's easier to obtain that with magnetically confined plasma than it is with lasers yeah i think um, so it feels like that one might be getting left behind slightly. Yeah, although I mean, you know, it pe- no. basically it seems that people are talking about the magnetic confinement stuff more yeah. than the than the inertial stuff. Um, but you know, who knows? These inertial confinement systems are again massive. Just yes. just the banks of lasers they have to to generate the mm. um, power is yeah. crazy. You know, and- huge warehouses full of of like tubes to magnify the lasers yes. and bend them into the right place yeah yeah it's crazy crazy yeah. stuff uh, on the subject of size size is really important to things like tokamaks and stellarators right in terms of magnetic confinement Seem, I think it seems to be yeah. the, the general and that's why that tokamak the ITER tokamak is so massive is the general thinking is that the larger you go with these things the better you're able to keep that plasma stable and contain the plasma yeah um, yeah so the fact that I mean that stellarator uh, a, a, a stellarator design power plant would their thinking probably be even bigger than this this stellarator they've got at the moment. Um, I don't know if the tokamak they're thinking might even be again bigger than the one they're going to design, or they're just going to be using you they're going to finessing the design of that roughly that size they think for a power plant. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure either. But I'm not sure they know either. But th- I think I think the thought is that bigger is better. Just yeah. the, the way it scales, the physics yeah. of it sort of seems to be that it's easier either to easier to confine or it's just generally a bit more efficient if it's much bigger yes which is yeah current thinking but yeah that kind of makes it sort of makes sort of sense i suppose yeah the effect that you've got a larger it's kind of like less space for it to get out it's kind of a bigger you know central core of plasma yeah. it's easier to sort of space area to uh volume ratio is, is slightly better yeah exactly yeah and actually, again, this comes back to, to cost as well. That's one of the reasons why things like this ITER project are ridiculously expensive. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're I mean, huge engineering projects, massive scale sort mm. of constructions, as well as being, you know, the actual engineering involved being a very, very high technical, exactly. advanced material. Which is why advanced. they crawl for development. Yeah. They're so slow. Yeah, 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 really slow. But... 
Yes, big There butt. may be a solution yeah. to all these these problems mm. developed by a little company called Lockheed Martin that you've, you may have heard of. A new startup. <laughs> um, so they've come up with what they say is a new design for a, uh, a fusion reactor. Yeah. That is going to be very small. And small, as we as we just said, it, it, that's very different to the uh, the direction that any of these other fusion reactors are going. Um, small would mean they are able to iterate on it very, very quickly mm-hmm. in a very you know totally different timescales to these these large ones. But there is some, or it's quite a lot of skepticism, I think, around from the nuclear fusion kind of expertise yeah. world that that this thing is even possible. Yeah, it's a it's a left turn from from. You know all the other designs we've been talking about. Yeah, that I mean, all have long heritage. You know, the Tokamaks yeah. and the Stellarators have all been around. Concepts have been around since yeah. the forties and fifties, basically. Yeah, this is called the high beta fusion reactor. So it basically works. I think it's, it's supposed to be about the end product, something the size of a jet engine. So tiny compared to these other. Ones. Yeah, tiny. I mean, mount that in a vehicle. Yeah, know, the you... the idea is that you would be able to put it on the back of a lorry or something. Yeah. Uh, and again, it uses a plasma confined by magnetic fields. It has a different shape, and they're in kind of like spindles and with you know magnetic yeah. coils running around. And the plasma doesn't flow round in the same way as it does in the other two, but it it comes out of these magnetic cusps and flows back round into the cores. And it's really it's and much more complex sort of geometry of yeah. the plasma with these weird sort of. Yeah, like spindly bits and yeah. stuff, and and things and plasma kind of arcs out and back in in a way that's very different to to in the Stellarators or the Tokamax. Yeah. So the high beta part of the name hmm. refers to um, basically the amount of energy they need to use to put into the magnetic fields yeah. to be able to to contain um, the a higher pressure in the plasma, right? Yeah. So yeah. beta is like a ratio of the amount of magnetic energy to the amount of plasma energy you get. Yeah. In the middle. <laughs> exactly. So a high beta one means it can be smaller. Essentially, you have you can contain it in a smaller area. Yeah, by and by using less energy. By using less energy. Yeah. Well, crucially, yeah, that's that's what it literally means. You yeah. use less energy, but it results in something you can make it smaller. Yes. Um, because you can contain that plasma using they use superconducting magnets, mm. um, which is one of the innovations of it. Uh, that combined with the the shape of the plasma they're using, um, creates like a very good surface to um, volume ratio. Yeah. And you end up essentially and also because they're using superconducting magnets it doesn't have I think there's some electrical instabilities if you don't use superconducting okay. magnets if you have like net ch- net current I think this has no oh, net right. current so you end up with a more unstable plasma if you have yeah. if you don't use superconducting magnets so basically they will sort of add up to a more compact fusion design yeah um, which is one of the reasons why it's you know so innovative and might potentially sort of save the world <laughs> um, and uh, they, the, I think the idea as well is that they'll They'll basically so the, the the neutrons that come out breed, and I think they're going to try this with the tokamaks as well. They breed tritium, which is a fuel, which is a fuel. Yes. So that they they'll impact the outside of the the sort of magnet uh, the sheath the the is that the word the sheath I think or it's blanket the sheath. Or it's a blanket yeah, yeah. Um, which protects all these magnetic and and basically the outside world from the fusion reactions and keeps them confined yeah. contained and and captures the heat yeah crucially captures the heat yeah um, and th- those impacts will generate tritium which powers which is fuel for the the ongoing fusion reaction and the the the, the heat to k- to k- keep that fusion reaction going is just generated by adding more fuel in essentially yeah. because they then you know begin to fuse and stuff yeah so that um, i mean that's self-sustaining in another level uh, another yeah. level as well isn't it because yeah. you're generating the fuel you need to keep keep it burning yes yeah by, by burning it but they're, they're going to try tritium breeding i think in all yes of i think i think that's generally thought to be i think because you you can if you chuck neutrons at lithium mm. you can make tritium <laughs> i have no idea how that works <laughs> but that's that's a thing yeah that can happen and they, they use they're using superconducting magnets i think that this crazy this crazy idea is that you have this plasma that's like 800 million degrees or whatever 800 million kelvin and just, just a cool 800 million yeah and then inside you have um these magnetic rings okay but they're superconducting magnets to help confine the plasma and there's there's various ones on the outside and the inside but the ones in the middle, yeah, the superconductors, they're 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 down at like not far off absolute zero to keep them, and they're you know they're not very far. They're very much there's just a a shield between them yeah. and the plasma, and there's this massive pressure at a temperature differential. It's mad, and actually, actually, the the way that I understand that the plasma works in in the in the in the Lockheed Martin one, and I could be misunderstanding this, but it, it seems to be that you have plasma 
all around these superconducting magnets. Yeah. So you have it obviously these spindle shapes kind of underneath or in the core of the of the reactor, but it also you have these arcs that go over the back of them as well, or over the back of the superconducting magnets. Yeah. So it these seems things. To be. Not, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of hard to quite quite work to out to exactly visualize what exactly what. Yeah. yeah. You need, we need to kind of see a a fully modeled diagram with showing uh, it's, it's not there's some there's some crudely drawn diagrams let's just say yeah. on the internet but it, but it basically it seems like you're going to have a, a temperature difference of about 800 million degrees yeah over the space of a few centimeters although having said that i mean that's you know that's going to be almost anywhere in it you know in the sense that room yeah. temperature and, and absolute zero it's just not that, that much different it's not that much different when you're talking degrees. yeah exactly although keeping something at super conducting temperatures is obviously tricky anyway even if you know you don't have yeah. a giant fusion reaction happening right next to it yeah so yeah it's still an engine it would be an engineering feat if they managed to you know keep the two separate and keep it working yeah but this the the announcement of this, which was only what last year maybe, or, or the uh, year I think they drip. That they started the project in like twenty ten. Mm. Um, I think the first information about it may have been made public in twenty fourteen. Okay, yeah, 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 that sounds about right. Um, and there's been more information subsequently released in twenty fifteen. But it's just suddenly, oh yeah, we've got this this design, which is you're going to be able to put on the back of a truck. Mm. Um, it's going to be very cheap. We can iterate on it very quickly, um, and test. And they're going to be able to. What, what were the dates they're going to expecting oh. a prototype within a couple of years right yeah a working prototype I think 2017 they said a working prototype that's next year yeah and then and then a production of actual uh, power producing power stations yeah, essentially I don't know if I... as of I think something like 2020 2022 no, 2022. 2022 yeah so, so that's five regular years. operation by 2022 regular operation so that's that suggests they're going to be generating power for the world by then yeah and so one of these things would be able to generate power for about eighty thousand people they think on the mm. back just on the back of a lorry just mount it on the back of a lorry and all sorts of other things that you, you'll be able to you'll be able to take them apart quite easily they can try and build it in a modular fashion so that if there's swap parts out yeah stuff, exactly yeah. so if they, they have there's problems with the neutrons bombarding parts of the the, the shield around the, these magnetic coils and stuff, the superconducting ones inside, um, and they were saying that if if it is an, an a very difficult engineering thing to have the have them have very long lifetimes, um, they'll try and build it in a modular fashion whereby it's actually quite easy to swap out parts. So you just sort of like lift off the top and just pull this magnet out and just stick another one in and then plug it in and sort of you know just try and try and have it in a very yeah a, a way that's very easy to fix and things so you just have like parts being shipped out you know self-contained parts and they bit it's like plug and play almost obviously not that simple um so that it doesn't take you know hundreds of the world's best scientists to try and fix one of these things every time it breaks <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and they, I think we're talking about air, how in aircraft parts, a lot of them are only designed to last a, uh, like a year of continuous use, mm. but they end up replacing them after X number of thousands of hours anyway. Yeah, um, just just in case, and they'd be doing something similar with the with these power these these kind of uh, these fusion power plants. They'd be just replacing parts when they look like they're getting a bit tired, and and instead of trying to engineer something that lasts for extremely long periods of time you just build something that's a bit cheaper and has less you know less engineering gone into yeah, it yeah just have routine refurbishment and just routine just refurbishment maintained um obviously this that's not trivial <laughs> no of uh, course not but but the thing is that the, the plan for these will be eventually to sort of mass produce them yes in a factory essentially in an yeah. assembly line um so that will, that will obviously bring the cost of manufacturing them down and the kind of expertise to fix them and the parts you'll need to fix them will also be mass produced mm. and yeah, I mean, is it seems pretty, it's pretty awesome. I mean, the I mean if it works, just think of the size of a normal power plant. You know, that powers, uh, uh, you know, eighty thousand people. Just you could have, you could have these in a, a large city. You could have loads of them powering. Yeah. You know, cities as large as London or whatever. Just, just dotted all over the dotted place. around, or you could and have you, a, a power station the same way, with just banks of them, maybe. Yeah, um, and yeah, exactly. I mean, you might they might be able to scale them up in the sense that you get they become more efficient, maybe as larger things. Once you perfected the design at a certain size, it might be much easier to scale it up than trying to build a big one every time. Yeah, yeah. So you might be able to get large, very large scale power plants, but also, I mean, if you've got lots of little ones, that's a distributed energy source. It'd be much easier to swap them in and out and things if, if something goes wrong or whatever. Um, and they're very mobile so you know bringing power out to all sorts of places would be yeah remote places or or, or just anywhere where you need mobile power although they're, obviously they're 
you know, not they're not going to be the parts for them to repair them if they have to have regular engineering works done on them. Is not they're not going to be easy to get a hold of. Sure, but in places where maybe you, at the moment you'd use like a fuel, a few uh, a petrol generator or something to generate electricity. Oh, what, like out in the wild somewhere. Oh, I don't think you're going to be doing that for a long take, time. You could take along a, a cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> like a camping reactor. fusion reactor. I'm thinking maybe maybe not for camping, but for somewhere <laughs> somewhere like an Antarctic base or somewhere like that. I think it might have too much maintenance to start with. It's just that, that you can have you know a normal petrol generator or whatever, mm. which is yeah, quite easy to fix. Which is quite easy to fix, and also you don't need that much power for an Antarctic base in the comparison to yeah, a city of true. eighty thousand people. Yeah. So you probably just go with that for now. I mean, you know, in the future, sure they might be able to make it so it is going to work you know have very very long lifetimes and stuff yeah. but it might just be a, for a, for a while into its operation might just be too you know too just just too too high tech for that sort of thing yeah yeah sure um but hugely promising for things like i mean they've talked about mounting it on in transport so ships yeah yeah um there's all sorts of i mean just just crazy Sh- ideas aeroplanes well space travel as well space travel especially for uh, not not necessarily for getting off of the earth um, no, but for traveling around the solar system, where you, where you could use things like ion drive that, that use an electric current to accelerate a plasma, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can have one of these things on board, get a huge amount of energy density out of this uh, of, of one of these. Yeah. Travel quickly around the solar system, accelerate, you know, very very rapidly, and things like that mm-hmm. with with things like ion drives. Um, yeah, and ships, exactly as you were saying. Uh, so like mounting mounting it on like a giant like tanker or aircraft carrier aircraft carrier thing, yeah. or container ship yeah container ships they just be able to run f- indefinitely with mm-hmm. very very small amounts of just hydrogen fuel yeah just have these things plowing all over the earth and as we were saying a few weeks back about automation <laughs> the thought of having automated ships mm. that are just are completely unmanned giant container ships that are just going around the world shipping yeah. cargo completely unmanned also with a fusion reactor on board there's something really cool about the thought of that just a robot ship yeah. with a fusion reactor yeah i mean yeah. this is the future <laughs> and and they talked you said uh, an aircraft um i think lockheed have talked about a particular being able to mount it on one of their large transport aircraft um yeah and so so yeah you fit it on that you and it would be able to fly for about a year on on uh some fuel that's i can't remember it's like a very just a small a bottle, small of, hydrogen, bottle basically. of hydrogen yeah for a year for a year <laughs> just fly continuously for a year yeah wouldn't need to land so you'd have weather aircraft and things that would just it would be drones type things just flying around yes although the aircraft that they said that they'd be able to mount it on is a big oh it's a aircraft. big boy oh, it's a big yeah yeah it's like a fucking sea fighting or whatever it's absolutely massive yeah it's the kind of thing that they use to transport around other aircraft inside <laughs> so yeah it's a big it's a big, yeah. it's a big lad it is big um, so I don't know if you'd have one of them just indefinitely flying around doing weather stuff <laughs> why not why not yeah, yeah. it's ch- cheaper than having a you know another one that has to land yeah if you could if you could turn it into a drone type thing yeah mm. I don't know I don't know if they need it for monitoring sea currents or something like that could you mm. you swap out the crew I'm just thinking if you could have it flying around this is pointless actually no you just do this on the ground I was thinking for like an electric jet. Yeah. If you could have one of these things fly, just flying around, flying designated routes that's just, it's got batteries on board that is constantly charging with its fusion reactor and you rendezvous with it with your electric aircraft and swap out your batteries for some fresh ones. Oh, that's, a, that's not a bad... <laughs> but you just do that on the ground, surely. Yeah, but in air and yeah, it's, it's like in air refueling. Yeah, that, that's why, that's what got me thinking. That's what they do now. If you do it on the ground, but obviously you have to land... So it might be used for military things. Maybe for like a long haul doing... electric electric plane flight where you can't battery technology isn't there. You can't take enough batteries on mm. board to, to fly the whole way. So you just rendezvous with one of these things over the middle of the Atlantic or something and swap out the batteries and then keep going. Or it will, ele- it will just recharge them ele- with a fusion reactor. Yeah, or electric military cra- aircraft if they ever decide to develop yeah. those because they, they refuel jets all the time in yeah yeah in the air yeah so. Uh, I don't know if they'll ever, you know, use electric aircraft for for military things, but no. But there's a, something kind of cool about the concept of a sort of a giant battery refu- a battery recharger just flying around, <laughs> powered by a fusion reactor. Yeah, just constantly going. Yeah, 
I mean, yeah, there's an endless. I mean, obviously, then you you extrapolate it out to not just you know aircraft and ships, but cars aren't obviously going to have their own fusion reactors. But all energy is going to come from these things. Oh yeah, like it's gonna, all the grids are going to be just flush with fusion energy. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be the answer to so many things. Yes, yeah, so it's just an excuse basically to electrify the entire transport grid. Yeah, I mean, suddenly everything. Yeah, suddenly that is going to be by far and away the cheapest. It's going to be the only choice for power, basically. Yeah. Everything else is just going to seem rubbish, more ridiculous in comparison. Yeah, I mean, the prices will obviously drop enormously once you have fusion going. Yeah. Um, because the amount of energy you can produce and the, the, the small amount of fuel that goes into producing fusion. And also, obviously, the environmental co- consequences of producing fusion energy are nothing. Basically yeah. nothing. Yeah. So... In terms of looking to fuel, you know, electric cars. I mean, oh yes, if if you if you fuel an electric car with electricity that's burned at a coal power station, you're still going to produce pollutants that yeah. you know damage, do whatever to the the Earth's climate and do whatever to uh, you know people's health. Even though that's still a more efficient way than doing it, if you burn fossil fuels in the cars through normal combustion engines, yes, still, it is. Still, you still release a net less. Um, amount of, of pollutants basically yeah but when you have fusion there's no, there's none not you don't even care about those arguments anymore yeah it's just gone. it's just the obvious thing is to electrify everything because suddenly it's the the cleanest way and it's the cheapest way yeah so everything from cars to obviously to trains and buses and planes um e- i mean everything basically and that stuff's kind of going that direction without fusion it is yeah anyway so it's just gonna that's just gonna be an acceleration you know it's just gonna be a catalyst to get that happening even faster probably. yeah transition yeah. our world into electric yeah yeah basically basically yeah. so yeah so i have said like it's very good it's gonna be great for the great for the environment great for people's health in ci- in cities i mean once uh, you know you electrify everything there's no power stations there's no transport producing fuel uh, pollutants I mean, a huge amount of pollutants damage people's health that you don't yeah. realise. In even in you know advanced Western countries, it, it, pollution's a real big health hazard. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we I was used to live. I lived in LA for a while. I remember we there'd be days where oh you know, yeah, you'd, you'd be told not to go outside and yeah. stuff because of the smog count would be yeah. really high and stuff. I, I mean, it's sort of much worse in in places like Beijing and stuff as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, I, when I was living in Hong Kong, the the I mean, the, the pollution levels were generally, you didn't notice, you just, you know, whatever. Yeah. I remember one day a uh, a, sm- a smog had come down from mainland China and yeah. I, none of us knew about it. We went out, you know, went did our, whatever we were doing. I, I was in uh, university there for a year and the, went de- went out to the university, came back and I was like, my eyes were itchy and I had a, a, like, I thought I had a cold or hay fever, like a hay fever type symptoms. And it was the wrong time of year and I hadn't had hay fever whilst I was in Hong Kong. It was a bit odd. It happened mm. one day. Went back and, you know, we were eating dinner watching the news. And it was, the pollution levels were like dangerously high. And apparently there'd been warnings all day and told people not to go out and stuff. And we had all just been out in the day of <laughs> it. And I was like, oh, that's, a, you kind of, for the first time, felt what a smog is like. But we didn't really know about it until yeah. we, we got back to that. But then it was, the, the, the air it was different it was very hazy very much more hazy than mm. it normally is in in hong kong and we just kind of ignored it but uh, that that's a bad example but i mean talking that's in, an extreme example yeah, that's yeah. An extreme but example it's all over the yeah you're right i mean big cities all over the world have problems with health problems caused by pollution to varying extents yeah so i mean this is it's, it's going to be well it very much depends on how quickly it gets rolled out um, across the world which will again depend on the type of technology that it is if it's something yeah. like this compact fusion reactor it's possible that um, it could be rolled out fairly quickly uh, but they're, they're assembly lines I mean, this is mass produced yeah. is what they're aiming for so it could be you know on, on a large time scale it could be the equivalent of someone turning a switch off with with, with, with pollutants like suddenly they're, they're no longer producing them you know over the course of, a, of maybe a decade or so we go from current production to basically nothing yeah it's all going to depend on how much it costs to set up a fusion reactor yeah. and the types of expertise you are that are going to be required to set them up mm. um well it depends on those things but it also depends on some more complex factors so if for example lockheed martin develop fusion yeah they're an american company okay yeah. are they i mean there's there's multiple f- factors that could come into play 
who are the, you know, they, they're going to have potentially I mean if they, they patent the design it's the only way to do it for a long time they're the only company selling it it's almost like a monopoly on the technology yeah, it's very lucrative very lucrative uh, ha- having a, a a tightly controlled technology that's that important could have knock on effects I mean the American government may say you can't sell this type of technology to these countries because we have diplomatic problems with them or whatever mm, yeah. so you know it might not spread that way yeah um, you know Lockheed might try and price people out it, it, what, I don't know I, I, I really don't know what their their strategy would be for I mean they're a company they want to make money you presume they just try and sell it to everyone for as good a price as they can so that it replaces all the other technologies yeah so maybe that's the bet I mean, in a way a, a good way a good angle I mean you really want two companies or three companies or whatever competing with different fusion technologies in order to get the best you know let the market dictate it but mm. if only one company has the technology for a long time to do it it could be a, it could be slightly problematic yeah it could especially if it leads to other things you know if if, if having I mean, that a huge amount of access, power yeah, could be given amount. to that one company yeah exactly um, uh, or, or country co- company slash country um, well yeah if, if, if I mean I don't I don't think the US government would do this because I think they recognize they would recognize that the benefit of the world having clean renew, uh, renewable yeah, technology point. is is beneficial to them yeah. it's not a competition thing it's hugely beneficial to them for everyone else to be in a much better place if everyone's happy and they've got energy and they can afford food etc cetera, etc cetera, you, you don't get there's, wars. there's no people arguing don't bother. with that there's no wars you, you don't have to not that fusion reactors are going to stop wars, but sure. well, they they might anything reduce that alleviates them. alleviates poverty basically, yeah, is going to reduce conflicts, yeah, absolutely, um, and obviously it's going to sort out uh, or start begin to to you know help out sort out the global environmental problems that everyone is going to be interested in trying to, you know, everyone's going to be affected by, and everyone's interested in trying to sort out, yeah, so. Yeah, I think I think I think there's too much benefit in rolling it out generally from for the u.s to for or anyone who who owns it themselves the con the country i mean mm. um for for not uh, yeah unless it's not, developed by a, some kind of like despotic like regime yeah. somewhere then yes you're probably right but it, then it's it's very i mean it's very different to something like the ita project where it's developed by loads of different countries from all over the place mm. and they all kind of have a part in it and they it all, all kind of benefit. come together to recognize this yeah. is a global effort to produce this yeah. for the world and they spend so they spend they end up spending like 30 billion in the end on this thing yeah and then Lockheed Martin do it in two or three years you know from, <laughs> from, from, from say 2010 to 20 so 12 years yeah and it's much smaller and you know they're the and only works, company that have a patent just, for it yeah I mean that's that that, com- that company if if although again they're competing with governments I mean do government, are the governments really going to listen to patent infringements and things like like that that I mean that that sort of stuff doesn't go down in in China they just they just pff, do not give a sh- it's like they they, they <laughs> in China they're literally copying um like uh, cars like is it Toyotas and things all sorts of other cars like British uh sorry American all sorts of other cars that are just ripping like, off the ripping, patents ri- straight off rip, straight up <laughs> ripping them off making almost identical cars yeah. and the Chinese government just looks at the uh these inf- these infringement lawsuits being sent out by these different western companies um just like and some like... uh, agent just goes that doesn't look the same <laughs> <laughs> um so it doesn't really work com- a company versus a government in that sense doesn't really work no no so 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 in a sense that maybe it will actually be copied and spread around that way for anywhere that Lockheed doesn't want to sell and maybe there'd be product. laws made about it or, or, or maybe a government would if if it seems that the benefit of this technology being widely used outweighs the kind of cost the kind of the money that a company would bring in if, it, if, the, if the benefits global benefits outweigh it maybe the American government or a government like the American government would would sign, step in and say you can't restrict it. You can't restrict it. Possibly. It doesn't seem... Yeah. I don't know. That seems that seems like an infringement on... Instead of a company just kind of going rampant and monopolising it. Yeah. Because because the world's energy supply could be controlled by one company. Yeah. Which is not really a good thing. It's not... No. Under, I mean, under not many... That's not really a circumstance you want. It's not really a, a situation you want to be in. No, because th- they then if literally, yeah, if they're if they're controlling the distribution and the operation of all of these things, yeah. because it could be that you know all the maintenance we were talking about, all the modular sort of stuff, they keep really simple, but it's all proprietary, and you need to mm. be 
paying. It's simple to fix, but it's not. It's very difficult to produce the components yes. that make it. So you need to get it from from Lockheed. I mean, having said all this, I mean they they make it. They're, the Skunk Works, you know, that division of mm. Lockheed, they're, they're very much, you go on the website for this thing, it's, it's very much like, this is a technology for the world, you know, this is all the things, that, these I know, are all the applications. that's marketing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. These are all the applications we have of, of yeah. that we, we see of, you know, it's all saving the world stuff. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing is they just, they'll milk the shit out of it. They'll be milking the, the PR out of that stuff for yeah. years and years and years. So trying to do something good with it is obviously a good thing it's just, it's just that that they'll be that, looking to make money out of it undoubtedly oh of course no that's fine but it, I, I, it's it's the the crossover between political influence that this that type of company might begin to have mm. with uh, that tech that's such an important technology mm. they could start saying oh we'll only give you this technology we'll only sell you this government technology if you buy all your aircraft from us all your whatever from us all your whatever from us and just you know monopolize yeah basically yeah um Maybe uh, like some kind of weird sort of uh, geopolitical situation where you have a company like that becoming a world player in the same way that, that a big country is. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, having a seat on the UN and stuff like mental stuff like that, you know, yeah, could lead to weird situations. Very, very odd. Um, so I, I would think though, once if if Lockheed did develop it and it is a successful project and it produces what they suggest it might be able to. I think there would be variations of it or or ways to get around the patent or whatever that would end up producing things that are similar to it mm. um that still uh, you're able to produce fusion reactors competitors would start coming out of the woodwork because there is no com- no one else is trying to develop something like Lockheed is at the moment yeah sure and every, you know all that that billions that's been poured into ITER and all that would just be like right get rid of that we don't need any of that anymore <laughs> Um, yeah. maybe if unless they still thought it was promising and might do something uh, to compete with 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 Lockheed's design yeah. in a different way for a different slightly different situation like mm-hmm. a big large scale power plant that might still be the best way to do it with a a token Mac or whatever yeah sure I mean it might be that this the Lockheed approach isn't viable for some un- unforeseen reason um, and yeah. then it falls through yeah of course of course this is all hypothetical yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and of these fuse fusion technologies of course are going to have a big impact on the the energy industry around the world as well i mean fossil fuels are pretty much dead and buried at that point yeah once you've got fusion there's almost no apart from the odd situation where fusion is slightly too high tech or requires too much maintenance etc etc like we were talking about earlier um say uh you know going out into the jungle and you want to bring a gas generator or something like Mm. that uh, a petrol generator then you're gonna it's gonna take over energy uh, in terms of producing an electricity in terms of powering transport it's gonna take over everything basically yeah well, pa- powering civilization generally so all cities and and transport within Which is, cities and between cities yeah all of that stuff yeah i mean there might be niche uses of, of fossil fuels still but i mean the the huge scale operations of, of mining fossil fuels out of the out of the earth yeah just won't be economically viable anymore we still have to reduce plastics and things from them that's a good point yeah so there's yeah no- i wonder how much the how it balances do you know anything about how how much of the you know crude oil basically that comes out of the ground is used for plastic production in compared to fuel production i think that the profits almost all come from fuels mm. I'm not 100% That's sure. That's intuitively what I would guess, but I have no, I actually have no idea. Yeah, we, I, d- I did some a bits of... I never really did that much on petroleum stuff and degrees or whatever, but yeah, um, yeah the bits that I, I, I picked up on, I, I'm pretty sure it is, it's mostly about fuel. Yeah, mostly. but I, yeah, but you are right. I, you know, there is there will still be a market for plastic um, production. Yeah. And there's obviously other uses of... of Oil, yeah. Oil besides fuel. Yes, and absolutely. plastics. Um, yeah, but it would change the landscape of that very hugely, hugely. Yeah. hugely. And th- other, what about other renewables? The, the things that some people, you know, things like Solar City, Elon, Elon's companies. Um, yeah, and huge pushes towards wind, wind, all that sort of stuff. Wave, you know, all the kind of renewable energies you see now. I mean, again, it massively depends on how what f- fusion looks like what fusion looks like and, and how, how it's controlled how, how it's controlled and how expensive it is to set up and all this stuff but i mean in in a kind of the ideal future in which fusion mm. does everything that it sort of promises now that it can yes. do there's no real need for any of that stuff no no not at all 
why why would you ever need solar power or I don't, you wouldn't. Unless, again unless like, you're in the middle of nowhere yes and, and you yeah. just have a solar panel with you to charge your phone or something when yes. you're camping yeah sure sure or, niche or uses a spacecraft might use solar panels yeah. or something like that but um, yeah I mean fusion will just replace everything presumably presumably I mean yeah you don't it's the ultimate energy source. Why? Why use the you know secondhand energy from the sun when you can make one in a box? Yeah. <laughs> Control it and, and and harness that energy directly. Yeah. Instead of having to f- you know capture it secondhand from yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's going to change a huge a huge swathe of different industries around the world. The way that you know allow us to electrify pretty much everything. Um, and it could be the technology that. Um, gets used for bases on mars or the moon and stuff like that you know especially especially if we're permanently living there with lots of people yeah you know the kind of spacex vision of of thousands to even millions of people living on mars you know this could be this could be like the power the, the first type of power source that you have on mars i mean maybe not the first but well when, for powering a city on mars i mean potentially this is like the well the in terms of in terms of if you can get one to mars <laughs> talk about mars already yeah. um then yeah i mean the, the fuel costs the thing is you can have so so little fuel to yes. power it for such a long period of time that it makes it a, the energy density is so high that makes it an attractive option for that sort of thing the only problem obviously is 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 maintenance again or, or that type of thing if it's, yeah if you can repair it with materials that are in wherever you're going mm. then it's a hugely attractive option so i mean for a city on mars anyway you're going to have to need, you're going to have to have in situ manufacturing of, of, of most things for a self-sustaining mm. city so that's going to be a problem with, with any technology you take yeah um, and you know things like like nuclear fission mm. is going to be a nightmare for obvious reasons oh yeah no, no. Um, and then solar power is just you just need a huge amount of solar, of solar panels and things like dust storms on Mars will will hinder that so yeah I mean it's, it's a pretty sweet answer for yeah for moon and Mars bases yeah yeah I tell you what, if we get fusion power, I'm going to go mental. I'm oh, not yeah. turning any lights off ever. I'm just leaving TVs <laughs> on all day. Like nothing. There's no the electric heaters on when it's summer just for no reason. Yeah, man. And if you get hot, then just open the fridge or something. <laughs> <laughs> Have a heater in a fridge. Yeah. So just balance them. Really. Like, who, yeah, it would just be there would be no rules. Yeah. Not that there is really rules, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm not like I'm not like begrudging turning the light off when I go to sleep. <laughs> like, I fucking wish I could leave this light on. <laughs> can't wait for fusion <laughs> yeah but if i go out the room and you know leave the tv on i just i just i just i won't care about that sort of thing anymore yeah there will be a shift Pe- people people will you stop do, worrying about do, that kind of stuff yeah, yeah you yeah, leave yeah. your light on in your room all day and you come back in like, oh shit i left the light on yeah and turn it off that's annoying. um when you've been to work or whatever it's, who cares just even, leave it on all the time yeah you won't even think about that yeah, yeah. there'll be no dark skies because we just have lights on all the time everywhere <laughs> never turn the computers off never turn anything off yeah because who, who who cares it's going to be it's going to massively so if you imagine a scenario in which this thing works and gets rolled out across the world it's just going to it's going to have massive repercussions everywhere yeah I mean we were, we were talking about it earlier what's it going to do sort of the, the geopolitical implications of it in places now where there's lots of war and, and poverty and stuff um, that's 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 kind of hard to really predict long term yeah. there's many factors. I mean a lot of those are, they're very, yeah they're very complex they're not really based on a lack of energy no but that that it, it potentially would remove or at least make the poverty situation better yeah so it depends how much of the kind of bad situation that you find in some of these places is rooted in the poverty yes um, if, it, if it's related to energy poverty i mean food's a huge problem it's a huge problem but then but maybe uh, maybe having it. like greenhouses and these solve all that yeah so you can yeah you can grow everything in greenhouses suddenly or, or whatever yeah maybe. and well i'll tell you another thing desalinization yeah water that's a very good point that's a, obviously a big problem in lots of places are very expensive to do desalinization processes converting seawater to drinkable water basically yeah. so that is going to be hugely reduced in cost hugely mm. and just having it and that's that's you know that's a purely a process that happens with electricity so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it could i mean it could just be the catalyst as well for development of other types of technology you know like like 
maybe maybe having access to unlimited power or not unlimited power but super cheap unlimited power really readily available power is going to be what spurs the development of ai or something like that you know it just sort of accelerates mm. technology development because i mean these things aren't you can't really they're not directly energy limited in the sense no that, they're not no. but but there might be a cascading effect is what i'm trying to say of, of once you know you're kind the of cost of running kind of removing so what, less so yeah, much less exactly um and it's going to have all these kind of weird, hard to predict sort of knock-on effects in other ways that might make sort of everything sort of accelerate a bit. I'm totally away from my hands. It's po- possibly, possibly like a trickle-down kind of effect. Yeah, yeah. Something I mean, it's the what, the biggest challenge that humanity faces is is just trying to get a reliable source mm. of clean energy. Mm. Mm. Um, fusion has the potential to solve that. So does that mean if we if we f- sort out fusion? <laughs> yeah properly sort of does that mean we're a type no type 2 civilization does it no No. i don't think so so the type 2 civilization is using the energy equivalent of your star right or is that type 1 i think it's type 2 type type 1's all the energy on the planet planet but we're not using all the energy on the planet no we're not using fusion we're just that's because the type thing doesn't make sense yeah it doesn't really make sense i mean it doesn't really mean anything anyway no um but isn't it all the I'm energy? Thinking, like, is it all the energy of your star? Is it? Does it literally mean using all the energy the of your star physically, or does it? The fact that we are capable of of generating of generating, much energy. generating essentially star energy. No, I think it's using the equivalent using of the equivalent energy, energy output right. of a star, or the consuming the energy of a star. The, okay, the, the so energy. we're nowhere near that. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I keep dreaming. <laughs> I want, I want to graduate to level two. Yeah, we're not even at level one. No, but, you know, disappointing. Anyway. But it'll get us closer. Yeah. So I guess that kind of rounds off our discussion of fusion. Hmm. Looks like um, it's an exciting time. Basically, there's a lot. There's a few things picking up pace. Yeah, I mean, over it's the every... next sort of ten years or so. Yeah, but the the, the classic kind of joke with fusion is that it's always 30 years away yeah i mean it's a bit you know a bit like ai a bit like going to mars and all these things that we we constantly talk about yeah but obviously that things like vr have always been said to be a long long time away and then mm. they've come around and and certain technologies had have, have done that um mm. i just i wonder if things like lockheed mean that it maybe maybe it's starting to be more of a realistic prospect that's not tied to the huge long iterative uh projects that cost billions on billions on billions yeah i mean maybe the lucky thing may not work out it might just be a kind of they're, they're overselling it um but but maybe people will start thinking about trying to find ways to reduce the size of these things more yeah uh, you know, take it more seriously that yeah, way. Try, try and think out, try, think differently from the traditional "bigger is better" route, yeah, which we, which we've said before in this episode, um, are the, the old technologies essentially. Oh yeah, you know, real they're, old, they're yeah. All three of the main, the tokamaks, the stellarators, and the inertial confinement, they're all based on very old ideas. So yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe maybe this kind of slight left turn, even if it's not exactly the the, the final product that you know is going to yeah. solve fusion is enough of a kind of kick in a different direction yeah. to start things you could get groups that aren't funded by m- huge multinational companies yeah uh, uh, conglomerates of, of different countries you know you, a, 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 a national a, a, you know a country could have its own small kind of fusion center that they they try and develop yeah. with a, a few research groups kind yeah. of thing like Lockheed's doing on its within its skunk works I mean, yeah, maybe maybe that's a different outlook. Even if it, that's the only thing, it's just an outlook change, not a technology real breakthrough. That there's yeah. Through. Suddenly, it seems to be something that mu- that more people, more companies, more they might think of institutions doing, looking can, into can look into. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's exciting, whatever it is, and I'm yeah. definitely going to keep my keep my eyes open for yeah more news from from the Lockheed side as well. As yeah, yeah, definitely, stuff. definitely, definitely. I mean, the 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 news for almost every other thing is going to come out so slowly yeah that you know it, i mean this you is don't, you don't keep your eye on it you just get surprised 10 years later when they come out and say we've made a 10 percent improvement in yeah. confinement time yeah whereas this is potentially going to have demonstrated built demonstrable prototype next year yeah so they're making big claims so and the you know the deadlines are relatively soon so we if they are not lying <laughs> i mean it's a big sure, deal that they're making they're, big claims it is it's a big Lockheed deal martin you know it's not 
They're not. Yeah, they they're not like an upstart kind of bad. trying to make a name for themselves. Kind of small startup. It'd be very bad for their PR if they came out with all this stuff and then in a year's and time went. Yeah, sorry about that. So that alone kind of make, gives it a bit of weight and makes yeah. me excited. Yeah. It's not just, yeah, it's, you're right. It's not just a small group of, say, academics over promising a theory that they've had. Mm. And that, I, that is more liable, I think, to um, a, a kind of pet theory type situation where yeah. someone's overselling an idea they've had. I mean, this is a company that's. Maybe like that's the M Drive, for example. <laughs> may, maybe. Um, where they, but, you know, they've, they've as, a co- as a company, decided that we can do this. This is publicly good for us. Yeah. And we think it's a realistic prospect that and, we're and going to be able to develop it and show people that's working the, prototypes yeah the crucial soon. thing is that they're making making noise about it as well it's they not, think they're, they're making not, progress yeah they're not doing it under behind closed doors and and yeah you know, in the quiet they're, they're, there's a whole like website dedicated to yeah. it and they're making they're making doing press announcements about it yeah i mean they, yeah and the, the thing and they could have kept quiet i mean they could have yeah. kept this on the back burner they must have gotten to a point where they're somewhat confident that they can meet these deadlines that they're they're announcing they weren't you know they're i mean it might be an unforced error but they're essentially doing it themselves they're not they're not being forced to make these announcements no so i mean it might be like the the d-wave computer thing where everyone was kind of doubting it that it was real that whatever and and they just like we think it works this way and and almost all the people in quantum computing were like no 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 it doesn't work it doesn't work it's not a quantum computer whatever and and slowly but surely they they change sides because it did seem to do dem- what they were thinking. Demonstrated that they actually they they had made a, some sort of yeah. quantum computer. <laughs> yeah, so That's awesome. May- maybe maybe it's something like that. Yeah. Well, time will tell, and and hopefully next year we'll have more answers. Yeah, relatively soon we should know. Yeah. So cool. very cool. Very cool. Uh, right. Nuts so, of the week. Nutters of the week. Yes, I have your turn. Uh, a little nut of the week story. A morsel. It's not particularly amazing. So but right. it is related. That's always good. Topical to today's. Basically, I say it's not amazing because it didn't make me nearly die laughing. But it, <laughs> it, but it is it is ridiculous. So um, it's a, it's called the free energy suppression conspiracy theory. Oh yeah, okay. I can th- already kind of guess where it's going to go. Gone. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, that there's a huge conspiracy to stop the world having free energy. Yeah. By big corporations like Lockheed oh man you're so close it's so close so it's a conspiracy theory that uh, a technologically viable pollution free etc etc already exists already exists like cold fusion oh yeah yeah. okay yeah. Um, and the corporations governments advocacy groups all these types of things are suppressing it of course because why because they always why wouldn't are they? suppressing it yeah are we suppressing it oh <laughs> for, for to some reason yeah. so the reason being that um just because they're kind of corporations and they do corporation-y stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You corporations, man. <laughs> you sit in the corporation building and they're all corporation-y. <laughs> That's a direct Team America quote. Yeah. Um, things like oil companies yeah. are, have a lot to lose from some developing fusion. Oh, yeah, so and they keep so, it So it's they, they, kind they of pay like off a... government officials, mm. people developing, starting to develop fusion technologies. They pay them off to try and stop them developing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the conspiracy. What do you what do you think? What do you think? Do you think that's a realistic? Do, do you think under any circumstance, in a, in a sort of even in micro examples, yeah. companies could be paying off um, researchers or anyone they see as a, a, a direct threat to their to their existence? I mean, yeah, I think that does happen. I don't necessarily mean specifically with fusion or with no. free energy, but I think yeah, that probably does happen on certain scales. Yeah, you know. I mean, why not? Even in totally above board ways, you know, you know, let's pay off a company, or it's like a bit like a buying a company out, isn't it? Like buying out your yeah, competitors in sure, a way. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and paying for, but something of climate this... change research, you know, that sort of points that you're paying for the results for. Yeah, that type of stuff. That, that yeah, that that probably does happen to a certain extent. Um, but the thing is. With with like climate change research, you're never gonna a company's never gonna be able to plug all the holes of, of actual science on a global scale. No, 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 of course. Of course. That, that, and and the same thing with this. I mean, how could that's you? The thing. How could you contain the entire world's sort of development of all these all these different multiple multinational projects yeah. like ITER and stuff? Like, how could you possibly? Well, they're suggesting that it's you know it was developed. Um... Or that maybe all that stuff's fake as a as a, a kind of front. 
Yes, yeah. I mean, it takes multiple levels of conspiracy to explain Classic. the fact that we need these huge projects, to, which, which, attempting these massive projects. It's so technologically difficult yeah. to try and develop fusion. And it takes so much input from so many different people, from yeah. so many different countries. And that somehow this all happened under the radar that was successful with all this money going into it, with all these people involved. And some oil company went, oh no, we want to pay 30 billion or whatever to stop this happening. And nobody told anyone about it. In reality, there's probably no money they could pay that would be more than, than the, the value of fusion would be, wor- would be worth. Yeah, exactly. The value of fusion is way more than any or single company could pay. Yes, it's just whether they could get in the early stages. I think that he was suggesting that you know in the early stages they start developing it and they just pay off a load of people. Yeah. The thing is, they're all they're all national efforts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess, I guess natural, they would global. say that you know that their their fronts, their national, you know. The, this oh yeah, the oil companies control the governments anyway. Yes, they? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's fine. And maybe the oil companies got their own sort of private armies. They that... they got their own fusion reactors. You know, their yeah. own kind of. I think that's one of the things is that you know you've got, they've got these cold fusion things already developed and Very ready good. to go and just just all suppressed, all hidden, all... just for their own personal use. Yeah, in their just... own homes. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, yeah, so just another another. So I wonder what these people, well. these the, the the conspiracy theorists, think about this Lockheed announcements, the recent ones. I mean, you can right just just make something up now. What do you think they say? Uh, that that's that's fake. That's part of the of the front to make the public. Hmm, actually, how how would that work? How would you how would you explain it? Yeah. Uh, it's a, fr- it's a fr- so I can think of stuff like ITER yeah. because it's big and expensive yeah. is a way of, sh- of pouring money look- into something that's not what it is yeah or- exactly making it look to the public like this is, is years away and never yeah. going to happen so like, don't, don't worry about it yeah. whereas it's harder to explain the Lockheed thing in that context yeah but you can probably make something up like I don't know the Lockheed's a, a wing of the, the queen and the queen like <laughs> is a lizard and the lizards they're actually not making a fusion reactor they're making an incubator for lizard eggs and lizard okay. eggs you could just sort of just say whatever you want yeah. and, and, and that's know, it yeah. that, that, that would that, as long as there's a conspiracy involved in it it'll satisfy them <laughs> it's an incubator for lizard eggs <laughs> that's, that's my new favourite conspiracy um, yeah so it's just it's just I mean what's more likely uh, well, that it's an incubator for lizard eggs. Oh, oh yeah, they'd probably make a pretty good incubator for lizard eggs. I mean, they like eight hundred million degrees. <laughs> <laughs> These, <laughs> These are reptilians. <laughs> oh god. Anyway, although I bet there's some fun. I bet there's a mental conspiracies about um, oh, what was it? The the Large Hadron Collider. Do you remember the conspiracy theory about the Large Hadron Collider? Well, the, the, it was the, the, we did we did we did in the nuts of the week like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it yeah. was like a portal to another dimension yeah. and there's loads of people like beings coming out and trying to take over the world and yeah. all the, the earth oh, tilting yeah. on itself, all that banana be... shit what about yes yeah, stellarators I mean oh, all man, this sort of that's stuff. ripe for that kind of stuff yeah I bet there's some good stuff out there actually mm. I should look that up yeah. maybe for next week oh uh, yeah keep it keep it for a future episode yeah yeah, portals to yeah, Stellarate portals. is obviously a, a portal. Uh, yeah, to- a Tokamak. I bet there's something in the name of Tokamak or something like that. It's, it's the name of yeah, like it's, a, it's like an ancient s- Russian god or something like that. Yeah, and like if you look back into like the ancient Egyptians, then you know you can see it carved into the walls of pyramids <laughs> and that kind of shit. Yeah, but you see an ancient Egyptian that got like a donut like sort of bagel piece of bread, and like, it's a Tokamak from years ago. <laughs> <laughs> they knew about Tokamaks. Man, maybe they did. Maybe maybe there's a conspiracy with donuts and tokamaks that's dead like the oh Krispy Kreme own uh, they're a big company and mm. they they they're paying for maybe they were the tokamaks. original they were the original sort of cold fusion company that have been suppressed by all the oil companies yeah and they just Krispy made Krispy Kreme yeah. yeah 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 and they just told them as a front you're just gonna have to turn your tokamak design into delicious yeah sugary treats yeah which which contain sort of chemicals that control people's minds yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we're on a roll with this yeah, we could be conspiracy theorists. We could just be theorists. writing our own Talk, theories. Talking that shit for hours. Yeah. And then, Which is why do we do sort anyway. of do that anyway? So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Business that, as usual. Yeah, that is the end of today's show. It is. Wow. Finally. <laughs> <We> got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, next next week. week, I have no idea. Neither do I. Do you have anything? I don't have no idea yet. No idea. I'll have to sort that out next week. Yeah, we'll think about it. <laughs> yeah.
Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, comments are good. Seriously, comment any comments. Yeah, yeah, good. yeah. We'll like questions, c- continue stuff to, to discuss. Chuck us emails at uh, offworldempire at gmail dot com if you want to get in contact with us about anything, uh, or leave your comments on the YouTube videos. Yep. Other than that, see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>